Not too long ago, I had encountered someone who was firmly convinced that most, if not all of the problems of the world, could be laid at the feet of what he termed capitalism. Now, normally, I do not engage with such people, and I'm not entertained by such discussions, as I typically find them to be a waste of time and energy, and they're almost never fruitful. But I did have some time on my hands. What followed was a litany of accusations against all the ills of capitalism, production, labor, and eventually human civilization itself. This arose because I had, in contrast to him, cited my belief that the problems of existence today are far too complex to be reduced down to a single coherent cause. Complexity does not mean complicated, necessarily, though complexity can and often does entail complication. I cited that in my observation, the scourge of the modern world and industrial country seems to be largely due to a lack of transcendent meaning, or perhaps even due to a lack of being part of something greater than ourselves as individuals. And this has perhaps something to do with capitalism, but not in its entirety. His response was that even if this were true, it can all be linked to capitalism and the alienation that ensues when workers and the common people are removed from the products of their labor. He was all in all a one-trick pony and maintained his contention that humans would have been better off had they remained a pre-agrarian hunter-gatherer society. But the sword cuts both ways. Stateless societies, for example, have always been vastly more violent and dangerous than states, and have progressed technologically little to not at all. The very conversation we were having over the internet would not be taking place. Our hunter-gatherer ancestors lived short, brutish lives of great pain, struggle, and suffering, with little to show for it other than reproduction and an endless repetition of what had existed prior to them. So perhaps he was right in some sense, whilst discounting all the other troubles that had plagued earlier societies. I hazard to guess few people, even those who long for the passing of so-called modernity, truly wish to live under those circumstances, and even so, it would require monumental carnage and destruction, neither a thing devoutly to be wished nor easily achieved. Again, the sword cuts both ways. And with new circumstances arise new problems, even as old ones fade into the background to be forgotten. A complex system is composed of many differentiated and autonomous, yet nonetheless interrelated and interdependent components or parts linked through many difficult to discern interconnections. Complex systems cannot be described by a single rule, and their characteristics are not reducible to one level of description. They exhibit properties that emerge from the interaction of their parts that cannot be predicted from the properties of the parts. And virtually all systems in nature are inherently complex, and though certain principal parts can be found and made clear, they cannot be used in a reductionist manner to explain the totality of the whole. Unsurprisingly, human society and civilization are, as part of the natural world, complex systems. They function, follow, or thrive on a multitude of interlocking parts that often defy simple description, which is what I was attempting to explain to the Marxist gentleman mentioned earlier, an attempt in vain, I should concede. There was a time when crop failure, for example, or more generally human misfortune, was blamed upon witchcraft or sorcery, when mythical gods were meant to be propitiated, lest even greater misfortune befall mortals. When, in 1755, the city of Lisbon was hit by one of the worst earthquakes in recorded history, one measuring 8.5 to 9 on the moment magnitude scale, or more traditionally called Richter scale, it claimed between 10,000 and 100,000 lives, nearly leveling the entire city with the subsequent fires and tsunami. It also triggered a new discussion throughout all of Europe on the nature of divinity sin, and if in fact it had been divine retribution visited upon man for his failure to live in accordance with the dictates of his God. In fact, this had been a very popular view most people held at the time, subsequently. Calamity, suffering, and struggle all naturally beget questions, and to questions people seek answers. More often than not, overly simplified answers, or sometimes, as in the case of the story of Job, none at all. Job is a wealthy man living in a land called Uz with his large family and extensive flocks. He's morally righteous, living in accordance with God's wishes, always careful to avoid doing evil. One day Satan appears to God in heaven, and God boasts to Satan about Job's goodness. But, but Satan argues that Job is only good because God has blessed him with abundance. Satan challenges God that 
If given permission to punish the man, Job will turn and curse God. God allows Satan to torment Job to test this bold claim, but he forbids Satan to take Job's life in the process. However, Satan is allowed to bring physical illness upon him, financial ruin, and deprive him of all the things that had made him prosper. He braves all his misfortune and in the end is rewarded by an apparition of God who impresses him with his omnipotence and rewards him for his faith and willingness to persevere with even greater prosperity. The takeaway here is that God works in mysterious ways, but an alternative to that interpretation is that life is fundamentally inscrutable. In other words, it is an abdication of understanding because it is purported man cannot understand. In lieu of this more general consensus that life is mysterious or inscrutable, and thus only the divine or magic can be appealed to, which themselves are not explanations at all, we humans advance a step further and look for silver bullet theories that can explain everything and reduce most everything to a singular cause, or at best a single concatenation of things, and that if only we were to break those chains, goodness and prosperity would follow for all. And we who live in modern are blessed with dozens and dozens of theories of how it all went wrong and how it all can be solved. Or are we? If you think about how we evolved, we evolved with certain innate limitations of perception. And by perception, I mean broadly our ability to see and understand. Sometimes these limitations are very concrete, such as our ability to only see the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum called visible light. Sometimes these limitations run deeper such as our inability to intuit complexity. There's never a need in all of our evolutionary past to either perceive or understand complex systems. Such an endeavor would have been a precocious waste of human resources when the only name of the game in town had been survive long enough to reproduce. However, we no longer live or exist in our ancestral environments, and shifts in environment when they are as radical as they have been recently demand a different approach and demand that we challenge natural inclinations and perceptions. Because if the shift in environment is radical enough, our ancestral past merely becomes baggage, weighing us down in an effort to grasp the picture we seek to understand, big or small. And this goes beyond understanding. It goes straight to the heart of something related to Job, with or without divinity in the picture, the question of a person's woes, and seeking after an answer as to why these woes exist in the first place. One of the first errors of inference human beings have always committed has been the inference of agency, where there is none. And oftentimes this can be called over-inference, which is to say that we over-infer agency and patterns and nature because we view ourselves as agents. And it is a natural thing to extrapolate from that view to extend it beyond the borders of its actual application. Hence why in earlier religious belief, agency was seen in the weather, natural phenomena, or disasters, as per the Lisbon earthquake. Over-inferring agency also gives us the possibility to hold someone or something accountable, where there would otherwise be no such possibility. This satisfies a deep emotional need that human beings exhibit, the need for, at the very least, the illusion of justice. The other major error of inference is over-attribution. Inasmuch as agency is perceived to be real, and more importantly, whether or not it is real, the twin part during crime with over-inferring agency is over-inferring attribution, which is to say some component of the whole or complex system is necessarily more important than others, or in some cases solely important compared to others. This type of observation is most relevant in the modern context because of the wide distribution of information and its ease of access vis-a-vis -vis the internet and social media. And into this vortex of information overload are funneled dozens of theories of attribution of cause and effect. There sometimes is a component of reality or truth to the claims being made. For example, it is a very large leap of faith indeed to infer agency in the eruption of a volcano or the crashing of a tsunami, but not entirely false to attribute weaknesses or flaws to a political or economic system. Referring to my earlier conversation with the Marxist gentleman, if one is concerned with equal access to distribution of goods, capitalist systems do create haves and have-nots that do not exist to the same degree in hunter-gatherer societies. It's a question of scale. But that observation misses the mark by overattribution because even in hunter-gatherer societies, there are still hierarchies, divisions of labor, and some degree of inequality. And more importantly, the implicit claim being made is that it would be possible to build a massive civilization without a macro-scale economy, when history suggests that the type of communal sharing he endorses 
only works with small groups of intimately connected people. Overattribution is the definition of missing the forest for the trees. But human beings are experts at hyper-focusing on one element and dividing things into binary narratives for easy digestion and consumption. And thus, you can take your pick of philosophies, political systems, groups or organizations of people to over-attribute your current state of woe to and be lulled into a profound sense of conviction and intellectual safety that, in conjunction with human ego, wards off any and all attempts to look at the bigger picture. What is the fundamental problem with overattribution, though? Going back to what I previously stated about complex systems, complex systems are, by their very nature, complex and defy attribution of any one contributing component more than others. They are the sum of their parts, and there are indeed many parts involved in a modern civilization. Think of ecosystems as another example. Is the jaguar or the tapir more important in the complexity of the Amazon rainforest ecosystem? Natural systems are complex systems, and human societies are not merely outcroppings of complex systems. They are complex systems. And the larger the scale, say in the complexities of a nation state versus the complexities of a small farming settlement, the greater the complexity, the greater the difficulty to understand the totality. But this observation, as undeniably true as it is, does not sate the human need for simple and easy answers. And we know this because everyone is playing the same game of overattribution. The left, the right, ideologically driven organizations, and you can take your pick of those, all of them can find some problem that if they were to be believed would solve most of the issues people face. It is reasonably simple. Find a comfort zone that is personally appealing, stay there until you drop dead, and make noises loud enough on the journey to death to drown out any evidence that runs counter to your narrative. Rinse and repeat, and you have the story of humanity's hitherto best attempts at understanding the world. But the emergence of complex systems theory as the better methodology of explanation and procedure displaces what we have always done. It's akin to telling people that there might not be a smoking gun. Instead, there might be hundreds of smoking guns. And this demands of people that they pay greater attention than they ever have done. And more importantly, and unfortunately in many cases, can ever do. But a basic framework is possible. Whenever you encounter unilateral thinking that only flows one way, that excludes other possible mechanisms of explanation, it would be wise to stay on your toes and approach such thinking and the claims made around it with inherent skepticism. But in doing so, you, the individual, will be up against a tidal wave of opposition, swept away by the ensuing currents, with neither raft nor lifeboat, and no reward beyond the likelihood that whatever understanding you do achieve will be methodologically more sound than that of others around you. Critical thinking and complex systems belie our instincts and intuitions about the world, because we evolve to think in myopic terms rather than complex terms. If too few of us do not relent in caving into this myopia, we will surely have hell to pay, because it is eminently observable that most, indeed, the vast majority of humanity is not ready to retire the evolved model they have unfortunately been saddled with, through no fault of their own, I might add, and to refit themselves with something better. Faultless though they may be, evolved psychology is almost certainly not the best way of apprehending the world and moving forward. Thank you very much for watching. As this channel operates off of the generosity and contributions of its subscribers, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Any and all support is more than appreciated. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.